Today, uh, novelists, griots, travel writers, and keepers of sacred stories. My name is Kathy Jackson. Uh, this is Kevin Pearson and Dr. Jody Allen. Yesterday we had five panelists. Today we are down to three, but we will make do because we do have a lot to say, and yesterday we didn't have a lot of time to say it. So I will get started with Mr. Kevin Pearson who will tell you about the 1619 Project. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We did this presentation yesterday, so we're going to try to make it a little bit different today, and hopefully we don't have the same people back today. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm Calvin Pearson, and I am the founder of Project 1619. Now, at the previous session, the gentleman talked about founding a uh, new project in schools called Project 1619. So I wonder where he got that from. But anyway, I, I handed out in your uh, package or in your seat today a little brochure on Project 1619. We've started Project 1619 because of all the erroneous and incorrect information out there about the arrival of the first Africans. They did not uh, land at Jamestown. As you've heard, they landed at Point Comfort, and that's why President Barack Obama designated Fort Monroe a National Monument because they landed at Point Comfort. And I'll probably talk about that more. Uh, my presentation today is to really talk about how information is passed down from generation to generation. And who can we believe? One of my close friends has a quote that I, I tend to use sometimes. And, her, and the quote go, is from Chinua Chibi, until the lions have their own histor historians, the tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And that can be related back to the Africans of 1619. Africans of 1619, they didn't have their historians or travel writers. They had to rely on their oppressors or the plantation owners to write their history. And as we've seen over the centuries, the translation of that history from generation to generation has been very inaccurate especially when it deals with the first Africans in Virginia in 1619. Most Africans and Americans in America do not have a clue about the social and cultural structure of the African lifestyle in Africa and what the Africans brought to America. Many people think that the pilgrims founded America in 1620. You'll be amazed if you go to the West Coast how limited the knowledge is about Virginia and the first Africans, the settlement of Jamestown. They have no clue about the beginning of America. We were brainwashed by inaccurate history books, movies, and many books that we thought were reliable. Those people of my generation probably remember the book Roots by Alex Haley, published in 1976. Now, those of my generation, we were glued to the TV set when we saw Roots, the Next Generation miniseries. We thought we were looking at a true and accurate portrayal of the, of the life of, Af of Alex Haley. But did you know that Alex Haley admitted that portions of his book was, were, fixed, or were fiction? Do you know that in 1978, Alex Haley was taken to court and he was sued. He was sued by American author Harold Colander, who had written the book The African. It was proven in court that the book Roots and the miniseries was based on the book The African. So what we thought was a true and accurate history of Alex Haley's family was part fiction. It was proven in court that the book by Alex by Harold Colan of the African. The premise of his book was about an African who was captured in Africa, about his ordeal through the transatlantic slave trade on a slave ship, his arrival in America, and the next generations of his family. If you go back and read the African, you will see that a lot of what you're reading is in the book Roots. Okay. We
This is in a smart room, so. Haley admitted that a lot of the storylines in his book came from the African. Characters' names, situations, all came from the book, The African. Can you imagine Alex Haley going back to Gambia in 1970 trying to research his roots? Can you imagine him going up to a griot and saying, 200 years ago, one of my relatives was captured. I know he was one of 15 million, but can you tell me about my ancestor? And he finds a griot that says, yeah, I remember your ancestor. His name was Kunta Kinte. How probable is that? If you've looked at the series by Louis Gates, Louis Gates will tell you that there, there are scrolls in Africa where griots have, from generation to generation have written about the history of their ancestors. So we go back to the question about who do you believe? Who can you believe? I have a saying that authors, and they may not like this, I have a saying that authors are not historians, and many historians are not researchers. If you go back and look at today's novels, you will see that most novels today have a quarter page of footnotes or in the back of the book they may have 10 to 15 pages of footnotes. We've gotten to the point today where you've got to research a footnote. <laughs> Every footnote, just because they use a footnote does not mean that it's accurate or it's true. And that's the reason why African American history in America has been distorted because people are using footnotes of footnotes of erroneous and wrong information. We thought Alex Haley's book was true and we found out it's not. My suggestion to you is that now you've got to research a footnote. And what you'll find out is that that footnote is a footnote of somebody else's opinion. And if that opinion is wrong, then the footnote is wrong, and the author keeps perpetuating a wrong footnote. Uh, let me stop there. I have some more to say, but I'll give my colleague a chance to, uh, to make a presentation. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Switch it the other way. Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I I'm not going to. Uh, also, I'm going to shorten my presentation and just talk a little bit, and because I really want to get to your questions and comments. I think you know we're here to have a discussion, and so, but when I just in thinking about the title of this um, presentation or this roundtable. I think when I think about novelists, griots, travel writers, and keepers of sacred stories, I think about how historical sources have expanded the study and teaching of history. And when I thought about this in particular, I thought about how we apply some of this information that we now have access to in the classroom. Because as we've heard here, we really want um, students, undergraduate students and graduate students to take on the, the task of learning more and teaching more and spreading the word about 1619 and everything that came after 1619. And so one of the reasons that we're able to know and hear some of the presentations that we're hearing today or yesterday and today is because people scholars have expanded what they consider scholarly sources. We not only look at folklore and novels, uh, contemporary novels, and we also, we still look at letters and diaries and legal documents, but we also look at what used to be known as non-traditional um, sources, oral histories, um, again, folklores, folklore, stories, folk tales, um, songs, music. We look at all kinds of sources because that's where we have to go if we want to know about African American history and African history. We can't just look at, again, the so-called traditional sources. 
And in the classroom, this is important. Uh, I think one, it makes the story more interesting for the students to look at oral histories, to look at the actual words of the, the people who were affected by um, these this, this different times in history, different periods, different events. And two of the sources that I use when I teach um, the intro to African American history, the first half of the survey, I feel that it's necessary to start in West Africa. I know when, when I look at my mom's old textbook and even my old history textbook, you look, you, these people started, Africans kind of appeared on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There was no acknowledgement that they had left the homeland behind, that they left family, that they left a system of government and beliefs. And the, the, you had the idea that they were waiting on the shores, waving for these ships to come and save them from their uncivilized state. And that we know, especially if we didn't know it before this weekend, we absolutely know now that they left a lot behind. There, were cult there was a culture and a civilization and so we need to start there if we're going to ever really understand African American history. And so I use, there are two sources, these are not the only sources, but there are two sources that I look at um, in, the, in my classes. One is the story of Equiano, and the other is the Princes of Calabar by Randy Sparks. And, and, I, and I'll say this right up front, that these sources could, are problematic. You know, they, they, there are issues related. You know, for a long time, people questioned whether or not Equiano wrote his narrative. You know, could he have learned English as well as he did to write the narrative? Well, linguists and historians um, have looked at this over the years, and they've determined in fairly, very convincing um, evidence that, yes, he did. He was intelligent enough to learn the English language well enough to write this narrative. Um, the story of the princes of Calabar, these two men who were capt who were part of a slave trading dynasty, um, were captured as a part of a, a political um, conflict in their area, and they were also sold into slavery. And their problem, this is a, a, a secondary source based on primary and secondary sources, and of course the interpretation of the author. And so there are problems with this also, but. One of the reasons, there are problems with all sources. That's my argument. There are problems with a diary you find from George Washington. You know, everybody, we always, for the longest time, if George Washington said it or wrote it, it was so. But we know, if we really think about and interrogate these sources, that we all, as human beings, self-edit. We, especially I think leaders, kings, queens, politicians, they know someone is going to go through their papers at some point and write about them, and they, t and they tend to take out what they don't want anyone to know. We know that, that's human nature. When we know, for example, when you think of you know, Thomas Jefferson, we know now that he left out a lot of stuff. <laughs> You know, and, I, as I, and an example I use with my students, and I say, you know, if you are keeping a journal as a, as a college student, and you're writing down all of the fun, fantastic things, and all of the, you know, the, the, the late nights, and the, you know, drinking parties, or what have you, you, you say you keep this, this journal for 20 years, and your child is about to go to college, are you gonna give your child the complete diary, or are you gonna give them a diary where you spend all your nights in the library studying? You know, so we all self-edit. I mean, it's just, again, and so if we look at all of these sources together, they, uh, they, they may have problems, but together they paint a better, a, a more complete, multidimensional um, picture of what the story is. And then it's also going to be up to our interpretation. And I think it's important for undergrads to start thinking about when they read Equiano or they read The Princes of Calabar, thinking about and interrogating, do I, do I believe this? Looking at the footnotes, what did the author say? What is the author's proof? Because not only do they need to learn how to interrogate historical sources, but that will also, I think, translate into interrogating just the daily news, which we know we need to interrogate. 
you know. And so these are skills that need to be learned, and they certainly can be learned in the classroom, in the, hist in the history text, because that's where we need to be questioning. If we're going to get a complete story, again, of 1619 and beyond. And I'm going to close just by saying that, as my colleague here, Mr. Um, Pearson, suggests, um, Alex Haley um, and Roots, there were some definite problems. Um, but where I give credit to Roots um, is that Roots taught African Americans, or at least encouraged African Americans to think that there were some things that they could know about their past. I think prior to that time, there was a belief that there was no way we could know anything beyond maybe our great grandparents. And so there are people who have actually done the research and know more about their families and where they come from and who they come from. And I think a lot of that has to do with roots, with all its weaknesses. It taught us to, to dream that we could know. Thank you. Folklore is the boiled down juice of human living. It does not belong to any special time, place, nor people. No country is so primitive that it does not have, that it has no lore and no country has yet become so civilized that no folklore is being made within its boundaries. Zora Neale Hurston said that. Folklore is the story of the people. So many of us who, the generation behind me and the next generation, they don't know the stories. Grandparents don't tell stories to them anymore. They don't know the superstitions, the proverbs, the things that I grew, grew up with. I show a film in one of my classes called To Sleep With Anger. It's by, with um, Danny Glover and uh, Mary Alice and a lot of other people who are in it. And it's about African American life, people who have moved from the South and gone to California. And they have the superstitions in there, the, uh, the stories that they grew up with in the South. And my students are lost. They don't understand it at all. It's like they're speaking a different language because something is being lost with our children. Uh, grandparents who are in their 30s can't tell the stories that my grandparents could tell to me. And just listening to them, they're too lost in their Twitter and their television and their laptops or whatever they're doing. So folklore helps us to connect to our past. William Bascombe, who is a noted folklorist, once wrote that there are four functions of folklore. One is to escape from repressions imposed upon them by society. It validates culture, justifying its rituals and institutions to those who perform and observe them. It reinforces moral and value and builds wit. It applies social pressure and exercises social control. So those are the functions of folklore. In terms of 1619, the 20 and odd African, Africans who came to this country, they were not slaves. But little did they know the 200-year-old nightmare that they and their descendants would live, that they would have to survive tremendous odds. But yet they left a folk legacy worth remembering. The history books are not going to always tell us that story. And so we add to the narrative, as, Dr., uh, as Jody told us, that folklore breathes life into those dry history stories. It's too bad that we don't have more of that in our classrooms. Um, folklore entails fairy tales, tall tales, and something that's called Munchausen. It means that they are telling these tall tales. This is a German word. When people tell stories about themselves, like I went out and I, I saw this, oh, I saw a big fish. It was just as big as it could be. And I went out and I caught it and I swam down the stream and chased after it. You know, that's a Munchausen. It is a tall tale that someone tells about themselves. Actually, you could tell them, say they're a big liar or whatever. Um, the Africans, in their country, they told stories. They sat around a tree, the griots. They told tales of wisdom. All of these things were the things that they brought with them to this new country. 
but they had to change some things in their story because to them they had a tortoise, here it became a turtle. They had hares, here they became rabbits. And so those ingredients had to be added into their stories in order to incorporate the new things that they were learning in this new world. Uh, there were stories that they told among themselves, the John tales, as they were called. Those John tales later were, became the simple stories that uh, what Langston Hughes, I think, told. Yes, those were the same stories they told in slavery. And the John stories were the ones that they told among themselves that made fun of the old master and mistress. And they didn't want them to know that they were making fun of the white people. They told tall tales in public to amuse their white masters and other people who were around them. But they had a secret language among themselves. When we talk about material folklore, the quilts that we know that they hung up to say that the, the, the freedom uh, people were coming, that you could go on, um, what is it called? The um, Underground. Underground Railroad, thank you. Uh, so all of this was a part of the folklore of Africans and how it changed in this country. I wanted to read to you one of the um, folk tales that I found in this book. Why the black man's hair is nappy. All right now, we are going to our races. We're going to find out where the black people got their hair from and how they got it. When it was time for the Lord to give hair, he called all three of these men, and this is what he said. Well, first he called the white man to come and get his hair. All right, the white man, he went on up there and got his hair. So the Lord called the Jew man to get his hair. So the Jew man went up there and got his hair and said, thank you, Lord. So when it got down to the black man, the Lord called him, and do you know what the black man said? Black man said, Lord, ball it up and just throw it to me. And that's how it's been balled up ever since. <laughs> Those are tales of humor, but yet within them there's a lesson for everyone. And that's what those, a lot of the folk tales were about. They were lessons to their children that we, we are this way, but we need to be more accepting of ourselves. And there were lessons to their children about how to act in public, how to survive in a white man's world when there was no justice for them. And so what we must remember about folklore is that it changed when it came to the new world. It incorporated Native American um, stories. They all merged and they became an American lore about a people who were once free and who wanted to be free again. <laughs>